My name is Betty Matheny. I live in Cavendish. When I wasn't hiking the Appalachian Trail, I am in the realtor business. Um, but all these years, you drive by and you see all the crossings for the Appalachian Trail. And I've always wondered what they've been like on the other end. What, what's it like when you see them from the inside? So that was what got me going. Can you think of spots where you see crossings? There's one on the way to Rutland, there's one on the way to Wallingford, um, down by Bromley, by Manchester, all the places that you just drive by and you don't even realize that there's a crossing there. Um, so I'd seen it for years and decided that this was going to be my year. And my goal was to do the whole thing start to finish, um, which takes about six months to seven months if you're going to do the whole thing. Um, unfortunately, I hurt my foot and I wasn't able to do the whole thing. But I did go from Georgia, where it starts on Springer Mountain, to Virginia. So I did 672 miles um, at the beginning. Took the train home from Roanoke, Virginia. Got my foot checked out, find out that it was arthritis, and I can go back out and just let me be my guide. So when I got home, I ended up doing Connecticut and Massachusetts. So now I'm going to be what they call a section hiker. Through hiker is someone who does the whole thing in 12 months. A section hiker does it in sections over a period of time. So last year I did 800 miles. This year I want to do another 800 miles. And then if luck is with me, then I'll finish it next summer. Um, so you can see on your sheet that it goes from Springer Mountain, Georgia. Now this is really, it would be shaped more like this, but they did it so it's a vertical map. So Springer Mountain, Georgia is where it starts. It goes up through Georgia, North Carolina, and Tennessee. It zigzags back and forth across the two state lines, and then up through Virginia. Um, people get the Virginia blues because Virginia is 550 of those 2,200 miles. So people are really anxious to get out of Virginia. So I got about a third of the way through Virginia. Um, in about a month and a half, I'm going to go back down and pick up where I left off and see how far I can get um, in a couple of weeks in March and the month of April and see how far I get. And then I'll do some more after that. Um, but it ends up here at Mount Katahdin uh, in Maine. And the last bit before you finish is called the 100 Mile Wilderness. There are no roads um, through that section. So in order to get a resupply of food, they bring it in on an old logging road and you pick it up. So that's about 10 days, um, eight to 10 days of just nothing. Um, about 4,000 people or so start the Appalachian Trail each year. Of those 4,000 only, about 25%, so only about 1,000 of those 4,000 actually make the whole thing. So I was one of those 75% that didn't do it. But the neat thing is, while I was out there, um, you meet a lot of people. The first question anybody asks me when they hear that I was going to do it is, you know, who are you going with? Or you're not going by yourself, are you? And I did. Um, but when you're down there and you get to Springer Mountain, 50 to 70 people start every single day. So you meet people. Um, and I hiked the first 400 miles with some folks that you'll see their picture. And some of them made it through. And when they got to Vermont, I was able to pick them up, bring them to my house. Um, they stayed overnight. We resupplied, fed them dinner and then took them back to the trail. So it was really cool to see the people that I had met at the beginning. Um, the trail is crazy. Um, I'll see if I can show you some pictures. This is a friend of mine who, in 1975, did it. Um, and his group of gear is very different than my gear. Um, 
Things are much more lightweight now than they used to be. Who's the, who's the Windows person? Oh, there it is. Um, how many people realize that part of the Appalachian Trail and part of the Long Trail are the same in Vermont? You've heard of the Long Trail that goes from the Massachusetts border all the way up to Canada? Well, part of the lower third of the Long Trail is the same as the Appalachian Trail. And this sign here shows you, um, telling you that Georgia is 1,690 <laughs> miles back the other way. Um, and Maine, if you're going to go to on the Appalachian Trail, is another 500 miles. It's around Killington, isn't it, Betty? Uh, that it separates. Yeah, it's called the Maine Junction. Yes. Um, and it's near the uh, Inn at Long Trail. Right. So there's the sign that you see when you're uh, at the approach trail. Um, even though you're at the beginning and you're near Springer Mountain, you have to hike eight miles before you get to the start. The start of the Appalachian Trail isn't until the top of um, Springer Mountain. So it says you've got to go eight and a half miles before you get to the start. And then another 2,190 before you get to, to Maine. When I started last March, um, I started on March 19th. And the first night was 19 degrees, and the second night was 24. Um, so you see these icicles, that was mud that froze, and that was the water that just came out of the mud those first couple of days. That's the sign right at the rock at the top of Springer. That was the actual beginning. Every once in a while, you would get to a hostel. Um, normally, you would stay in your tent or a shelter, and you're going to see a picture of a shelter in a bit. But every once in a while, there are hostels, which is really just a building or a house uh, where somebody has said, OK, we're going to take in hikers. And when you, after you've stayed in your tent for 10 days in a row, when you get to a place that has electricity, a washing machine, a shower, and a bed, you feel like you're in heaven. Because staying in your tent, you know, every night you set it up, you take it down, you set it up, you take it down. That bunk looked so good when I first got there. <laughs> so that was my first night in a hostel. That was at above the cloud. When you start in March, you're able to see through the trees because there's no leaves on the trees. So you get good views. This is Blood Mountain. This is Oh, maybe 30 miles in. Um, this was a stone shelter that was built probably back in the 40s. There I am on just a rock uh, right near Blood Mountain. Whoa. Sorry. There are things that capture your eye no matter where you are, whether it's how in goodness name these two rocks ended up like that, you'll never know. Um, but when you see something like that, you can't help but stop and take a picture. Um, who would think that you would see a shell um, up in the woods, nowhere near in the ocean? Um, but it's that was a snail shell. Mm -hmm. um, I had never seen anything like that. This is what we call trail magic. You would get to a road crossing, and for some unknown reason, these wonderful people set up a table with real food. Um, you, you'll see in a bit what, what the food that you eat is like, and it's nothing like fresh stuff. <laughs> um, so we call these people trail angels, and they're performing trail magic. Um, they just sit there all day long, um, offering food. These people, their daughter was hiking, 
Um, so they would stop every once in a while and just open up their car and help everybody, knowing that their daughter would be coming along sooner or later. This, when you see signs like this, that's a sign of the border between Georgia and North Carolina. And when you got to a border, it was a thrill because you could cross one of those 14 states off the list. You only had 13 more to go. <laughs> um, and that white mark that you see, that's two inches by six inches. And that's what we call a blaze. And that's how the trail is marked um, from one end of the trail to the other. When you're out on the trail, um, you have a, a name, um, a trail name. My trail name is Magic Feather. And you, sometimes people are given a name uh, while they're out there. Um, one of my hiking buddies was given the name of Pop-Tart because she knew every flavor there was. Um, so that was her name. I came with my name. Anybody see Dumbo, the movie? Yeah? Remember at the end, um, Timothy the mouse handed Dumbo the feather and said with this magic feather you can do anything and Dumbo was able to fly. Well, there's a picture of Dumbo with the feather in his nose and my kids lived way back in the hills in Cavendish, way before things like you know, cable TV or anything like that. And we had the VHS tape of Dumbo. If they watched it once, they watched it a hundred times. So Dumbo was ingrained in my brain and the magic feather told me that that was all I needed to be able to do the hike. So that's me and Pop-Tart. Um, again, this is springtime before the leaves are out. And that is probably one of the spots where we got the longest view. Um, you can almost count the ridges um, as they go out, and I think like six or seven was the most that we had seen, but the, the Appalachian Trail follows the Appalachian Mountain Range, which goes, you know, all the way up the eastern seaboard. Um, when you're up there, too, you have no sense of direction, no sense of where you are. Um, you just know that you're going from one mountain to another. Um, but you don't know where the towns are, you don't know where anything is. And then all of a sudden you come to one. So these are five people. We all started the same day. Um, we didn't hike together at the very beginning, but probably about mile 50 or 60, we realized we were all going about the same pace. So the five of us hiked for about 500 miles together. And then I dropped back because I was having trouble with my um, pack, um, and they all went ahead, so, but I'm still in touch with them. Uh, the connections that you make while you're out there are amazing. Um, so we've got Dagwood and Stogie and Bandit Feather and Pop-Tart and Z. And the reason you have the trail names, you know, you think of a common name like Mike or John or, you know, Carol, you'd meet ten of them, but you're only going to meet one Stogie. You're only going to meet one magic feather, so that helps you keep track of who's who. Just another view. And again, this is all before the leaves come out. Um, and just like you saw those two rocks, trees would catch your attention. Um, and to me, that looked like either some sort of unicorn or something coming up out of the ground. So I had to take my picture. This was uh, an old lookout tower. It was a horrible rainy day. Um, and again, there were no views from there. I think there would have been on another day, but the rain was so torrential. Um, this is a shelter. And periodically, about every 10 to 15 miles, there would be a wooden shelter that would look like a run-in shed for a horse, you know, a three-sided uh, building, low roof, open front, um, but and it would fit probably about eight people sh sleeping shoulder to shoulder to shoulder. Um, and, it, you know, there's no such thing as a boy side or a girl side. Everybody is just out there together. Um, but that day was so cold and so rainy. I think we fit about 13 people in there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, somebody would come in and they were almost hypothermic. Um, so, you know, you did whatever you could to help them get through the night. 
The only time I stayed in a shelter um, is when it was raining. Um, it, it was, your tent was so much better. What do you do if it's like thundering and lightning? Um, lightning is a good question. Um, you don't, you don't want to be on the top of a ridge, like, you know, where you saw some of those other pictures. You don't want to be um, under the tallest tree that you can see. Um, if it's lightning's really close, there's there are a couple of positions that you can take. Um, one is down like this on the balls of your feet, just having as little contact with the ground as possible. You know, your path would be separate. You would just want to keep yourself as protected as you possibly could. Um, and then you just cross your fingers till it goes by. Um, if you if you know a storm's coming, you know we I'll talk about it in a minute. Um, that you would have some radio contact and stuff. Um, and you if you knew a storm was coming, you wouldn't head out. You would perhaps stay a day um, in a shelter just to protect yourself. One thing that amazed me was how much the trail changed on any given day. Here's a spot where it's just a, a you know, a, a little path. Um, and you'll see there's a spot. Those rocks are the trail. Um, so using your hiking poles for balance, um, you know, you have, have two and you really needed them because you, while you're stepping from one to another, that was this kept you upright. Especially with the big pack backpack. Yeah, I'm going to make everybody touch that. Um, sometimes you would have just a rocky patch short, other times, um, three miles of that nonstop. Um, it, it's grueling, uh, it's really tough. Sometimes it's on the flat, other times you're climbing, um, and then sometimes you're going down on those rocks. Just another spot where, again, you we've gone from the little lane to the rocky spot, and then all of a sudden you'll be at the top of what we call a falls, where there's no trees, and that will all be in the course of one day. Um, you will see that much difference in the terrain. That's an old shelter. Um, you know, that would probably hold about four people, but that gives you a sense of um, just how crude they are. Your water you get from a brook, um, that's, and you filter all your water. Uh, you don't drink it plain. You, you never know if an animal has been upstream and left manure or whatever that would contaminate the water, so you filter everything. This is um, a podcast. If anybody's interested in hiking, I would recommend listening to this. That fellow's name is Steve Adams. Um, he's got the podcast Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail. Or if you're down south, you call it the Appalachian Trail. Um, and he interviews people. Um, he comes out every Thursday with a new show, um, interviews a hiker, reads a section from a book, um, he talks about gear. I stumbled on him by accident, um, really enjoyed it. I went back to number one and I listened to all like 300 of his podcasts as I got ready. Uh, the, in, the bottom of that <clears throat> subtitle, the subtitle, oh, yeah, yeah. you want to mention what that is? Yeah. The Ultimate Midlife Crisis. When you're out hiking, there's sort of three age groups of people that you bump into. There are people in their teens and 20s that usually have just graduated from high school or college. And they're maybe taking a gap year before they go on to their real life. Or they're uh, the 20 and 30, I mean the 30 and 40 year olds who maybe have um, just either changed jobs, perhaps had a uh, a different relationship breakup or something, so they're out there for a mid, you know, a midlife crisis. And then there are the people like me, the 60 and 70 year olds who are nearing retirement, and this is their chance. And when you saw that group of five people, two of us 
were, one was 68, two were 69, one was 70, and one was 22. And age goes out the window, because everybody's goal is to get to Katahdin. It doesn't matter whether you're 20 or, you know, 50. It, you know, everybody helps each other. So, but anyway, so that's where he was going with that. Um, there's, again, the trail winding through flowers. Um, this is Clingman's Dome under sheet. This tells you that this is the highest point on the trail, over 6,000 um, feet above sea level. The top of Okimo is about 3,400, I think. Um, so this was twice that. Um, I haven't gotten to the lowest part on the trail, which is 140 something, and that's in New York. And sometimes the trail is very boggy, and they put down, that, um, there are trail crews that are all volunteers that maintain these trails. They go out every year and cut brush, um, and spots that are very muddy, they'll put these big logs for you to walk on. Um, they don't always protect you. There is a little video of, see how, let me see if I can make it zoom in. See how um, slow the water is coming out? That, how can I do this again? Well, I guess I'm not going to. That arrow on the near left, I think it would be. This? Yeah. Yeah, I hit it. Oh, there we go. See the water dripping off the leaf? Um, there's just a tiny little slow of water, and to get it to go into your water container, they put a leaf, and it just drips off that leaf. Um, sometimes you'll find a gushing brook, but sometimes you just sit there for 20 minutes, because that's how long it's going to take to fill you, your bottle. And then I have a filter that screws onto the top of that. Um, while you're out there, what's that remind you of? Come on. Yeah, there you go. I swear every, every day I would spot a, a stone somewhere that shaped like Vermont. There's a newer shelter. Um, it had, you know, covered spot on the left and picnic tables. Um, sometimes you will come down off a hill, have to do a road walk, and then go up. This is just before we head into the Smoky Mountains. That was at another hostel. Um, there, this one had some cabins that you could rent or the hostel that you could stay in and just in campfires and good people. This was at the top of one of the hills. It was like a, a radio tower. But then, as I looked at that, I thought, oh my goodness, it looks like A.W. root beer. <laughs> um, and I was, you know, I, my fingers were crossed, but no such stuff. Lady Slipper. Um, again, just, you know, you'll, you'll come out of the woods and then all of a sudden just have a view like this. And at one day there was a great big rock that I sat on and I thought, okay, I'm going to have a snack. And I looked up at the tree that was about five feet away from me and somebody had carved a bicycle into the tree. <laughs> This was some trail magic. This one, this one takes the cake. He um, has a big pot of oil that he is frying handmade apple fritters. So you come out of the woods and there's somebody with homemade apple fritters just ready to give it to you. It was unbelievable. He drove, he's got a vehicle on, the, on this side of it and he towed that old truck body, and that was where he kept all his tools with him. He calls himself the frying, the flying fritter. Um, but just he just felt like doing it. Um, so this was mile 300. Um, again, just like when you cross state lines, when you get to those 100-mile points, you know, that's another cross-off on your list. Accomplishment. Yes. Yeah. Um, sometimes you are going through farm fields. Not It's not all the trail in the woods. So to get over this barbed wire fence, there are some wooden stairs going up and over. 
Um, that was at the top of Big Bald. I think that was in the Carolinas. Um, I had the same jacket on. The wind was probably about 30 or 40 miles an hour. Um, but, and it was crazy. So that, um, this that you see is your nose wiper, which you constantly be using. Um, stairs, you know, the, the trail angels or the, you know, the trail crews do a great job. Um, so they have to build those stairs because of erosion? Yeah. To keep, yeah. To keep the, uh, the trail from being just washed out? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that sack that's sitting there is made of Kevlar, the same bulletproof stuff that, you know, police protect themselves. That's called a, um, an ursac but it's a bear bag, um, and you would tie it to a tree, and so that if the bear were to come, he can't get it off the tree, and he can't bite through it. Um, protecting your food is hugely important. You have to do one or two things, either have a bear canister, which is a big plastic thing that your food is in, and then you store that about 100 feet from your tent site, um, or you hang your food, um, in a bear bag like this, about 200 feet. And again, more trail just showing you how it changes. Same thing. Um, this was the longest stone walk. Um, I thought it was probably about a half a mile down. And when you got to the bottom, there was a waterfall. And here we are about to go through a farm field and walk right up through the middle of the cows. And they just look at you and saying, okay, another guy coming through. That's the trail, you scrambling up those rocks. Sometimes you are hand over hand, you know, to support yourself. Um, this was Grayson Highlands um, in Virginia and you, the wild ponies and you're just walking right too. You can see a baby. Um, again, more nice trail. So sometimes you get gorgeous paths to go through, and sometimes this is what you've got. As you can see, there's now leaves on the trees. So this is, you know, a few weeks later. Um, I was out from March 20th to uh, June 5th. So, you know, April to May, um, the leaves came out and spring happened, so you go through acres of that mountain laurel. Um, there was not another field with another cow. We have apps on our phone called Far Out. It will give you an elevation um, point like this. It will tell you there's a parking area, so a road crossing there, um, a tent site, a picture spot, streams. Um, so the goal this day was to go from here to here, which was about 10 miles, and stop and have lunch. So when you first start, you're going about 8 to 10 miles a day um, until you get your legs underneath you, and then you're built up to 14, 15, 17. You know, some of the younger crew could do 20 a day. I, that was not me. Although, there's something called slack packing, where you would leave your big pack behind and just take a little day pack, and you'd have only the food that you were going to eat that day while you were hiking, and you'd go from point A to point B. So you might get dropped off here by one of the hostel people and be able to do 20, 22 miles to another drop-off point, and they'd pick you up at like 5 o'clock and bring you back. And then you'd spend another night at the hostel, and then the next morning they'd take you back up here and you'd go north back with your big pack. So it was just kind of like taking a break, you know, having an easy day. Did you try that ever? Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> after a while, yeah. I think, oh, yeah, I can do it. Or, you know, <laughs> if the hostel people offered it, you know, they'd be in charge, you know, you might have to pay $30 for them to drop you off that next day. Um, so with a business also for that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. absolutely. So more different trail, rhododendrons, 
um, another style over the barbed wire. Um, and when you've got 35 pounds on your back and you've got to climb that thing, hold on to the thing and then turn around and climb back down, you think twice. You know, you, you're pretty careful. And um, I was staying at a hostel, and that fellow that's in front of us is about 80 years old. He ran this hostel, and he decided to um, hike out until he found me instead of, you know, waiting at the other end. How do you charge your phone? Like, uh, when you're good question. Um, I'll show you. You've got a battery pack. You learn how to turn your phone off from... Um, cell, you turn off the battery to um, a low battery mode, you turn the um, brightness down to the least, so you turn it so it's going to use the least amount of electricity um, or the least amount of battery power during the day. Um, and then at night you would turn it off and then you would have a battery pack that will usually charge your phone about three times. So you could get a couple of days out of your charge on the phone and then be able to charge it again. And then by that time, you would need to resupply your food because you're carrying about four or five days worth of food. So you get to town, you charge your battery, you charge your phone. Um, and I think all but about two days of that two and a half, three months or whatever it was up there, I had a signal and was able to call home. Um, so even though you're in the middle of nowhere, you're up high enough that, you know, you're getting satellite signal. So that was pretty cool. So this fellow um, came out to meet me and then took me back to his place. Um, so now you could hike all before when we were down with no leaves on the trees. You would get views all day long. Now you're getting one or two, maybe three views a day because you're in what they call the green tunnel. Um, so when you have a view, it might be a good place to stop and have a bite to eat. Um, just like we had our July flood, um, they had some wicked rain uh, down here. And this was uh, on a big suspension bridge going over a river. And this was the front field of the hostel. It would have looked just like Dixby Field or just by, just like by Kimber Inn, you know, that flooded. Um, so that was a day that we stayed put. We obviously weren't going to attempt to, you know, find the trail that day. So we just stayed in the hostel another night. And the people that were coming late, um, the, the night the rain started, the hostel took everybody in, you know, just not going to turn anybody away because that's the kind of people that are, you know, looking out for you. This is what your feet look like after um, those mud days. Mm -hmm. One of the, um, the, um, the you leave no trace, um, one of them is to stay on the trail no matter what. So even though there might be mud puddles going down the trail, through the middle of the trail, that's where you've got to go. You can't skirt around them. Because every time you skirt around, you're causing that erosion. Um, so that's what your feet look like. And that's why we wear these um, gaiters to keep the mud from going, you know, into the inside your foot, now inside your shoe. But it, it would be pretty nasty at the end of the day. Um, 800 miles and I never saw a bear. Um, I did see a couple of snakes. I did not see any poisonous snakes. I saw a lot of deer. I saw a lot of birds. Um, spiders? So, eh, I mean, oh. spiders don't bother me. Um, it, it's the bear that you know you, you want to be a little cautious of. Um, the other thing that's out there, and I never saw them, but you saw the damage they caused are wild boars. Um, they would tear up the sides of the trail, um, stirring up all the bugs and stuff. And I guess they are actually more dangerous to people than the bears are. Um, bears are a problem, they're a nuisance when people don't take care of their food and use the bear canisters or hang food because the, the food entices them to come towards a camp spot 
are coming towards a shelter area, and that's when they're a problem. And I mean, the trail just in one day will change so many different ways. But there you see the blaze on the tree um, and the trail through the grass. That's in Vermont. That's in Vermont. That stone wall is up in Norwich. Um, you know, we see stone walls here all the time, but they're like this. That stone wall was about five feet tall, and it went on for like a mile and a half. It was the most gorgeous thing I've ever seen. And, Aww. yeah. Aww. And can you guess what that might be? A dam. You got it. It's a beaver dam. We had to walk right across the top of that beaver dam to get to the other side of the trail. The trail used to go through. The beaver decided that was a nice place to build his, his dam. Um, and we had to just keep going. This was in Massachusetts, um, Upper Goose Pond. It's a place where you, there's a, a shelter and volunteers will go and stay there for a week. Um, and it's one of the few shelters that had doors and windows. Um, it has stone fireplace in it. And the family that stays there cooks breakfast for you. Um, and it was just by donation. And then it sits on this Goose Pond and they had kayaks and things. Um, so sometimes you would take what they call a zero. You would take a day off and just relax for a day. Um, usually you did that in a place where there was electricity so that you could charge up, but sometimes it, it was just so nice to have peace and quiet that you would stay there. Trail through the ferns. That's what the mud can be like. One time it went actually up over my socks. Um, a swamp and a beaver pond that the trail went right beside. This is Mount Greylock, and just over the Vermont border in Massachusetts. If you ever wanted to do a day hike, there are some trails up the top of to Greylock. That's a tower that has a staircase um, that goes all the way to the top, and you can look at all those windows. And there's a stone lodge there that serves lunch, and there's a bunk room hostel there. So you could actually do a day hike, hike to the top, stay overnight, and then hike back out. That's a red newt or a red eft, E-F-T. Um, and you have to look really close to see those spots. Um, I think they're different than the red salamanders we have here. Who do you think did that? Beaver. Yeah. How about that tree? This one. Just, wow. Isn't that crazy? Yep, cool right over there. Yes. Yeah. And think of the hours that it took those volunteers to make those stairs. And just, you know, to make life easier for us. And those would be great stairs. Down in Georgia, there was a spot called, not Big Ball, Beauty Spot. Beauty Spot Gap, and you came out of Beauty Spot Gap and had to climb. And they had stone steps, but honest to goodness, they were probably this tall um, and up a whole hill. I thought I was, I was exhausted by the time you get to the top. So there's my tent. Um, I loved my, oh, and that, this is a bear canister, so that's what my food um, is stored in, um, and my pack. Um, that's a two-man tent, which to me was perfect. And most people do use a two-man um, because you've got room for your sleeping pad and you. Um, and then you've got your backpack and your electronics and your journal, and you have everything laid out. And every night you set things up exactly the way. And it's like having your own room when you were a kid, as opposed to the shelters where you're shoulder to shoulder and the, your tent's much more. Um, this was Pop-Tart and Lilo um, when I picked them up here in Vermont and took them back to the trail. And Stogie and my son and, you know, just some others, again, that you picked up. This is one of the mottos of um, the trail, never quit on a bad day. 
um, which you know makes a whole lot of sense. You know, you might think, oh, I can't do this another day, but if you just keep pushing, you, you get past it. Um, so unless it's an injury, um, that's that's pretty much the case. Anybody have questions? Um, there's some sort of facts on the sheet that I gave you. Um, let's see, why did I go? Math and miles, people, family, trains, mud, views, weather, trees and flowers, problems, resupply. So you would go, um, like I said, about every four or five days, there would be um, a spot where you get to town and there might be a shuttle or it might be a mile walk into town. And sometimes you're getting your next days or four or five days worth of food at a Cumberland Farms. Um, sometimes there'd be a Walmart and you could get, re you know, real food. Sometimes you'd stop and be able to get a pizza. But you often would stay overnight near that, you know, town or you'd go right back to the trail and keep going. But um, that would be your resupply. Talk about filtering your water, hostels, pack. Gear, trail names, trail magic, tents, shelters. Some people are using hammocks instead of a tent. Um, and that hammock will have a tarp that goes over it. I don't quite understand how they can keep all their gear from getting wet and what have you. To me, the tent was much better. Um, there's nothing worse than packing up a wet tent. I do have to say that. Um, that's, those are the nights that you would end up staying in the shelter. Um, Journal. Um, I think most people would keep. Um, I kept a little um, zero day at Weary Feet because of flooding. The next day, um, I went 11.6 miles. That brought me to 649. So you keep just your stats. Um, but then I also did keep a real journal. Um, and I made myself write in it every night. Um, and from that, I did do a blog um, that was called um, magicfeatherhikes.com, which I would say don't look at it right now because <laughs> all of my, um, I would take those pictures and I would put them into a YouTube video. I needed the tech support that you guys all know. Um, but I would put them in and I would tax that. But when I just changed real estate companies, Somehow my email wiped out all the videos that were attached. Oh, wow. So now I'm having to upload them all again to YouTube. So in a week or so, I'll have everything pop back up. Um, but yeah, feel free to um, check that out. Um, you, would you like to show us your path? Yeah, sure. Um, so you have the far out app that had that map that showed the elevation. It also shows the turn. Um, there's something called a Garmin, this little gizmo. Um, every two hours it would send a beep um, to the sky and my husband and family could know where I was. Um, they could pull up the Garmin app on their computer um, and they would see where I was all day long and where it stopped and whether it had good progress that day or not. Um, so that was one more thing you had to charge. Um, um, I do the Jimmy Fun Walk for the Boston Marathon, or um, the Boston Marathon Walk for the Jimmy Fun every year. So I wore this Jimmy Fun um, hat, and I think I figured it out that um, how many, I, I have it written down, but how many um, marathons it would be if you did the whole thing. And I think I ended up doing like 60 marathons. Um, before I put it, which is still pretty cool, but I wore that hat. Um, I keep my snacks here. Um, this is called the brain, that's where I keep the filter. Um, and then this side, I had a chair, you had a sitting pad, and your camp shoes that you'd wear. Um, this full of food, um, probably weighs about 32 to 36 pounds, um, which I'm going to have to get used to it again. Um, 
a lot of people do it for a whole lot less, but I there's nothing in there that I really couldn't do without. Um, maybe this year I'll trim it down a little bit. Um, I have a stove in here. This is I threw stuff in last night so you could see it, but um, the stove would usually be packed. Um, in the warmer weather, I sent my stove home and I would do what we call cold soap. Um, breakfast for me was a couple of packages of um, oatmeal that you just pour the water in the bag and eat it right out of the bag. Some people would um, heat up the water. I just ate it cold because to me, oatmeal is oatmeal with maple syrup. So I pretended it was something else that I was eating, not real oatmeal. Um, but I have two bags of oatmeal and a package of fig bars for breakfast. About 10 o'clock, I'd have like a cliff bar. Then I would have lunch, um, which might be um, tortillas and peanut butter. Or um, what else would I have? Um, again, it's all food that you can just keep in that canister, you know, and it can't be anything that's perishable. It's got to be something that you can just store. Then I'd have another snack in the afternoon, and then dinner would be some sort of dried something. It might be ramen, it might be, where am I threw the package? Um, this is a five-minute meal, organic farro and pumpkin. Um, and you put this in your bowl, add two cups of boiling water, um, and you'd have a hot dinner. When I was cold soaking, once warm weather came, I would put this in my bowl with the water in the morning, and then when I stopped at the end of the day, it was all hydrated and I just ate it room temperature. Um, but if anybody wants to see what the pack feels like, you're welcome. Uh, I think Michaela, no, Michaela had, uh, wears a heavy pack all day long. Michaela, I'd like you to compare that to what she has. No. Come on, no. Give, see, see how that one feels compared to your backpack. Okay. You're carrying um, water. So you have your small um, bottle of water here and then a big one on the side. So put one arm through. How oh. am oh. oh. <laughs> oh, no. How does it feel? It actually feels kind of lighter than that. It does. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and, and it rides higher, doesn't it? You know how yours rides low on you? Why does it ride? Why does it ride so high, Betty? So it doesn't your lower back. You want you want the these hip belts to be over your um over your yeah. It's lighter than my back. It is. Yeah. It's actually pretty balanced, like. I mean, we would snug this up, you know, these straps would be longer, but, you know, when you get it on, it, it moves with you, um, but it still changes your, your center of gravity when you're going up and down hills. Um, what do you think? Could you do 12, 12 miles with that? No. No? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no. Alan, would you like to try it? No? Michaela? Michaela? Lydia? Oh, I know it, I know it, I know it. Gary? I know it. Try. That's two more It has a nice system to it, doesn't it? And as, as Betty said, there's nothing in there that she oh, yeah, could do without. <laughs> How we, you know what? I have a scale. We can, we can test. Yeah, that's pretty heavy. <laughs> um, you would have heavy. your food. 
Near water? Your food, your water, um, your sleeping pad, you would have two pairs of other pants. Two, two, you don't have to put it on. Two um, bras if you're a woman. Come here. I was I listening to see you're, you're pretty strong. Ready? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh. Now, this is size. This is going to be small for him on, on his case. Um. Hey, yeah. <laughs> oh, what do you think of it? It's a backpack. Uh, he's yeah. yeah. Does it feel? <laughs> oh. Yeah. You think you can do 12 miles with that? Oh, no. It's a good one. It still needs to be adjusted. That's heavy. This is, these are my hiking pants. I have some merino base layer on underneath my down top socks. Merino layer, another merino layer, another merino layer. Um, a windbreaker. I do have a puppy in there. Um, I have a bowl. I have my electronics. Um, my tent. I don't know. You, you don't. Can I just put a pin on Marino? You just said Marino several times. Yeah. Because we have talked some about it. That's a local sheep uh -huh. uh, from my town, Wethersfield. Uh -huh. uh, it was the first place that had Marino sheep. And I, I too am wearing merino layers uh -huh. today. Yeah. yeah. Great wool, and it was it, a lot of, of course, there was, uh, you know, about the history of, of factories and uh, of wool in this town, and uh, Weathersfield, where I come, also part of it. But it's interesting that you're wearing that that particular wool yeah. that made this area so, like, famous and yeah. important. It, it's the insulating quality of it and the durability of it are amazing, except for what your hiking poles do to, um, you know, mm. they trashed it. But that's a small price to pay. The, the shirt's still good. Um, but the hiking poles have done it in. Bernie, question? Anybody have a Bernie question for Betty? You guys have been really good. It's been, it's uh, just about lunchtime too, but a oh, follow up? I am, that's a real good question, and that's the reason why I got the chair. I'm one who only sleeps about five or six hours a night, but when you're out on the trail, dusk comes at you know eight o'clock or eight thirty, and people are tired, and people start going to bed, and people are in bed by nine. I would wake up at one or two in the morning and sit there and think, now what are we going to do until six or seven when we start to get ready? So I bought this chair that weighs a pound, and you know it's one of those that you can fold the legs and put the little hammock seat in. So I could sit up and I'd write in my journal or I'd, you know read or whatever. So I would sleep probably from like midnight to six, um, but you know other people slept much more. That was just mine. You know, um, as I was. Looking for uh, things on here, I went to one of the um, Appalachian Trail websites and things, and it just says it had all these different questions on here. Uh -huh, yeah. You know, it talked about safety on the trail, yeah. um, and that most times, you know, except for bears yeah. and being careful about things, uh, that most people were safe. It's the first question that everybody asks me is, are you going alone? And yeah. they have this in the head that, you know, you're going to meet all kinds of crazy people and what have you. And, and especially a woman, you know, they said that. Yeah. They and said most time. I met no one that gave me any qualms, um, you know, over, over that three-month period. Um, you know, again, everybody's looking out for each other. It was, it's really great. And you meet great people. There's not a day that has gone by since I've been off the trail that I've not thought of the trail or thought of, you know, someone that I've been hiking with. Um, and I will still text. Um, How about, you know, uh, you, you mentioned also, um, one of the things I talked about in this was um, knowing yourself. Mm -hmm. And knowing if 
you needed to stop. Mm -hmm. And they talked about the percentage, and you mentioned that earlier, um, being safe of knowing how to stop at the right time to protect yourself. Um, but it, it also, um, how about preparing though? Preparing, no. um, it's not something that you go, ah, I think I'll go tomorrow. No, I mean, A, it's the gear, by the time you're done, is expensive. Um, you know, it, it, I gathered gear for a couple of years before I, I finally went. Um, I also would say don't ever buy gear online. Um, go to an outfitter who will fit to you. Um, I have another pack of one of the super lightweight packs from z -Pack. Um It probably dropped my weight by about three pounds, but it, it absolutely cut my shoulders in half. Mm. And I got to a point where I either needed to get a new pack or get off the trail. I mean, it, I, it was that bad. So while I'm out there, I have to go spend more to get another pack. So going to an outfitter and having someone fit to your body um, made a huge difference. Knowing that you can't buy your sleeping bag um, at Walmart and have a 40 degree bag that when you're starting in March and it's 19 degrees, you better have a 10 degree bag or something. And, you know, multiple layers. I went to bed that first night wearing, um, you know, one piece of shirt and my face layer. Um, and after about 20 minutes, I got up and put on all the rest of my clothes okay. and my rain pants. And I never ever wore my rain pants out. Um, they were always to be my safe backup um, because they kept body heat in. Mm -hmm. And you do not need to know when to, to you know, quit. Um, you know, you, you don't want to get hurt. I'm a little nervous. I'm targeted to go back out March 20th and pick up where I left off. And that's the same day I started 600 miles, 672 miles further south. So now I'm starting in Virginia the same day, and I'm going to be in the mountains, and it's going to be cold. So, you know, that makes me a little bit nervous, but I'm actually going to hike with Steve Adams doing the Triple Crown. Um, McAfee Knob is one of the spots that you see lots of pictures in Devil's Tooth, and I forget the third one. Um, but he's going to meet with four or five people, and I'm going to hike with them. So. You know, if I have to stop for a little bit after that um, mm -hmm. because it's cold, I will do that because, you know, I can't risk being, you know, hypothermic while you're out there. There are some parts of the trail that are flat. Mm -hmm. Was it Connecticut? Virginia? Is that Virginia? Um, Virginia's not so bad. Uh, Connecticut um, oh. was very flat. For you are going along the river for a lot. Massachusetts wasn't bad. Um, but then again, you know, then all of a sudden you'll hit Mount Grey Lock and you're right back up again. And the Green Mountains. Um, but, you know, the, you're dealing with two and three thousand foot mountains, not the five and six thousand foot that you were dealing with down south. Um, but well, once you hit the whites and the main, you know, it, it steps up again. Yeah. Um, and I've not done any of those. So there's two websites on there, one or two podcasts that are really good. Um, and then one website, the um, Appalachian Conservancy, is um, a tremendous um, resource. Well, thank you so much, Betty, well, for coming and yeah. sharing that with us. All right, quite an expedition. Yeah. And we look forward to maybe following you when you do. Yeah, I'm looking to go back out and hike about six weeks and then come back and then go out and do another leg. Um, so I will, I'll send you an email when the magicfeatherhikes.com is back up and running. Okay. And then you can share it with anybody that wants to see. Great.